I'm Brian Mallard. And I'm Stacy McCarty. Welcome to another edition of Day Trip. Today we're in Lumpkin, Georgia at their annual fair on the square. It should be a lot of fun. We got some cool stuff to show you this time. One of the genuine treasures of life in America is the small town fair. Welcome to Lumpkin, Georgia at their 41st annual Fair on the Square. With everything that you'd expect from such an occasion, happy visitors milling around checking out the stands, people selling various goods, and let's not forget the quintessential weekend food in the South. This man has won awards. Then there's the candy apples and hot boiled peanuts. Stacy and I ambled along the sidewalk toward the first of several highlights of this trip. It is a place that Stacy had come across some time back and was very interested in. Here we met Joanne Brazier. We are inside the historic Bedding Field Inn in Lumpkin, Georgia. Uh, the inn was built in 1837 by Dr. Brian Beddingfield. He came to this area after the removal of the Indians. The Lower Creek Indian Nations were the first settlers in this area. He also had a business in Lumpkin, and on one of his many business trips to New York, he bought a veil that is still used in the Methodist Church today. He was born in Washington County in eastern Georgia and got his medical degree from Augusta. This is a public room. This is where the people registered. This is also the room where the men relaxed and socialized. This is a desk. Um, it has um, little keyholes that could have been used for mail or messages. Still has the old felt on it. Isn't that gorgeous? I love the house, though. This is a piece made in Stewart County, and you can tell was dusty now that the bubble glass is in a lot of the panes in the house. The dining room is the largest room in the house. It's kind of dark. The piano is of a later date, but still very useful. It's still used in the house. It still plays. It does. Following on through the dining room, we saw some beautiful old handmade furniture, as well as other historical items of interest. This is the ladies' parlor. Um, you notice when you come up to a stagecoach, and it has a right and a left door. There's always two doors. The right door is used by the gentleman, and the left doors are the left door is used by the lady. You notice over the doors and the windows are the shamrock designs. The shamrocks, as well as the carpenter locks, made by the carpenter company. And Stacy gives her take on the house. As we walk through here, is, um, you can really get a sense of the period in this building. I think because it's been, it's got historic period furnishings in it, but it hasn't been restored to death. But some of these period homes we go into, they're older, but they're so polished and redone that you almost don't get a sense of the age of the structure. And here, you really feel like this is a historic old building. Everything feels original. The, the floors, the doors, like we're noticing like the weird lock on the door. It's just, it's very amazing. It's, it's really interesting to be in here. Another item of interest are the paintings on the walls. The brightest room in the house, I love this room because it's bright, because it's bright. This is a melodeon and it could be, have been taken off the base and taken to um, singings and things like that. It doesn't work anymore. This is the only original piece of furniture in the house. This ha room also has one of the closets in the house. The house has three closets, and in those days you paid tax on the number of closets you, that you had in your house. Which, if I'm not mistaken, led to the invention of the Schiffer robe. I also later learned that no two fireplaces in the house were alike. Each one is unique. 
on the table you'll see a, it's a very faint photo of Dr. Miss Betty Field. This is a copy of his obituary. Wow. On the table you'll see instruments for measuring medicine and also a bleeder that is thought to something similar contribute to George Washington's death. And this is a sewing cabinet. This little sewing cabinet, the wings come up, it's beautiful. It's lined with material, fully lined. It's a beautiful, it's, um, you know, veneer. It's covered. It's, it's really beautiful to me. That is gorgeous. Then she took us out back to show us a neat architectural feature, the kitchen. This is our porch because it's a breezeway. All the old houses in the south have one. The well sits at the original well side. We have two water rooms. The kitchen is not original to the house. It fit the foundation and was brought. It was given by a family and brought here. Very little um, cooking went on in here. Only the um, light, you know, sandwiches and things like that. To your right, you'll see a picture of the house before and after the restoration. And these pictures are important. You can see the state it was in before refurbishment and the, the difference that it made. And a huge difference. I mean, you'd have to have a really good imagination to get from that to this. Yeah. Certifications are proudly displayed on the walls. And on to further items of interest. And this is a cabinet that was used in the railroad, and it actually has the man's date, name, and date when he made it. And the yellow paint throughout the house is known as buttermilk paint, and also the blue. So this is known as the South Kitchen. This is where the main food preparation took place. <coughs> There's a roasting jack over the um, fireplace that could be, be wound and used to roast meat. See that you have to have a key. Oh. But I, we don't have the key for it. But it's a pretty nice, you know, you could put the key and then it just pours around. This is where the actual cooking was done. I can only imagine that the food that came out of here was absolutely delicious. And so it was back into the main part of the house to check out and get a tour of the upstairs. And this is called the single room, and it's done as a child's room. This is also the room that has the other two closets in it. Um, if you want to look into the closet, you can see the lays underneath the plaster are still in good condition, oh, and so yeah. they just replastered. That's what the superstructure of the house is. Stacy investigates the room and the closets. On a stand are some very old books, probably some very interesting reading. This book is from 1839. Let's go across the hall. And the thing that's different in this room is the clock on the mantel. The painting was done on the inside and it's viewed from the outside. Oh. This is pure artistry. You'll also see um, we have pitchers and water basins in all rooms. And underneath the edge of the bed, you'll see the chamber pot. The chamber pot and a bed suspended on ropes. Probably very comfortable. And this is an example of the blue paint. Remember the yellow buttermilk paint from the kitchen? Here is an example of the blue. Let's go see some more. This room is known as the Johnson room. And the, actually the only thing that's different in this room is the chair predates the house. This chair was made when ladies wore bustles on both sides. And also the bed warmer, you know, used to get, put the coals in and draw it down through the sheets. These things give fire marshals nightmares to this day. And an old sock? Not exactly Haynes. Castle bedroom. This is the largest bedroom in the house. 
Um, the Cannonball bed is on loan from Chattahoochee County. And I have it, you know, we have the baby bed and the youth bed. We have old quilts on the trunk. And this room also has one of the corner fireplaces. The house, the chimneys in the house had to serve more than one room, more than one fireplace. Remember the fireplaces? And there's another of those old cool clocks. Well, these two are especially different from the other ones. Yeah, very. Mm -hmm. And back to the tour. Thought you might be interested in this old handmade shirt right here. Where do the articles of clothing come from? Like the different socks? Families, or, I guess. Different families. Different families um, have done different rooms. I like the uh, newspaper. Anyone care to read an article from 1840? <laughs> the last room in the house, this is the bedroom that has no fireplace. Um, this is where you spent the night if you cannot pay the 12 and a half cents. It was bought in 65, and in the late March of 66, the commission started the renovation on the house. I do not know how long it took. But I think everybody worked very, very hard on the house. The commission, the people I know, the elderly people that, um, you know, cannot do things anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it was a, a community effort. And with our tour complete, Stacy and I headed back down and out as new visitors came in. We left them to connect, and she and I headed back out onto the streets to the 41st Annual Fair on the Square. Activity out on the square was lively. Stacy headed back to her table as she had rented a booth for the day. I set a course for my next destination, where I met Randy Butts. Okay, so I'm at the jail in Lumpkin, and we're gonna get an interview and a little footage of the building. Uh, the building was given, us, given to the Stewart County Historical Commission about two years ago from the Stewart County Board of Commissioners. Uh, they built a new jail and so they didn't need this one anymore and they didn't want to spend any money on it to renovate it. So uh, now we're using it for the bike ride, bike registration. We were using a local church, which was about three blocks off the square. So the, the bike ride was not part of the family square. So now we're on, on the square and part of it. We just recently renovated the upstairs and downstairs hallway. We got, had beaded ceilings and we had a leak in the tower and the beaded ceilings were completely gone, uh, bucking and rolling, and you could see daylight through them. Replaced both of the ceilings and painted the walls and the trim. This structure was built uh, in the first decade of 1900, probably 1908, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the real part, the jail part, is fireproof. Cement floor, cement first floor ceiling, and a cement second floor ceiling. So it's considered fireproof. The front part that we stand in was the living quarters for the sheriff who was a resident sheriff mm -hmm. and their family lived here. The It'll just be used, probably used just like the Bedville Inn as a museum mm -hmm. uh, for public use. You know, any groups could use it for meetings, right. community meetings, community events, just like we're doing today. And on to the tour. We went upstairs first. Room one. This one is still in need of restoration. Nice. Rustic. That's the before. Though not structurally compromised, this room does need a lot of work. The next room contained volumes upon volumes of old legal material. This room is in pretty good shape. Oh, yeah, it is. It'd be a nice meeting room, you know, because they're big rooms. Oh, yeah. And as you can see, the old jailhouse has a great view of the city square. But next, the ultra cool reason we're Ooh. actually here. Cool. Randy took me back to show me the actual jail part of the building. The first thing on our tour was the indoor gallows. Seal it up, man, because after they quit hanging people, they put central air heat up there. 
But they was a hammer there that would pull them and drop down in like that. Wow. Yeah, uh, one person here. Just one. Just one? Yep. In the early 1900s. Wow. After one phone call. The first holding area was very low security. I think this was sort of a trustee here because he was on the call and all. Uh, this is the was called trustee, but better prudence. Yeah, cozy beds. And still writing on the wall. Followed by other various cells. And finally we headed up the stairs toward the more hardcore area. Starting with a room of a very serious nature. That's the whole cell for the death row guy. Ooh. Exiting the death row cell, we walked out and got a look at the gallows and the lever that was pulled to open the trap. Well, the execution is they have to open this up, pull this hound to drop the floor. That, ladies and gentlemen, is where people got hanged. Reportedly, only one man was hanged here. Wow. Then on to the very heart of the jail itself. You put 16 men in here. Look at these locking mechanisms. Yeah, that locked these doors one time. This was straight up jail. There were four beds in each one of these little eight by rooms here. That's pretty tight for me. Wow. That'll be very tight. I think I've hit it level. In the daytime, they had access out here. In the night, they just locked them up, locked them down. Nice. Wow. Though far from a modern prison, one could see that this place was far from flimsy. And if you were locked up in here, you were just locked up. All the hardware in here is heavy duty. Oh, they ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Though there's nothing fun or lighthearted about a place like this, it is visually very neat. So cool. Cool in retrospect, not cool if you're like a resident. <laughs> and all this would be left intact when you get everything done as like a museum. Yeah. Yeah, we'll touch it. Nice. Wow. Open air shower. See the open air shower? Oh. Oh, yeah. This, ladies and gentlemen, is where soap was not dropped. <laughs> wow. And in the next room, some more private sales. Did they have a big prison population here, a big jail population I don't over know. the years? Uh, it had been used for about 30 years. Wow. Not, I mean, they had the sheriff's office, but they didn't, they didn't put any prisons here. Right. They put some of the American soldiers. It's just no. Jail tour complete, we headed back down the stairs and I went back out on the street where I found something a little more lighthearted. Parades are another activity indicative of American life. Small towns and big cities alike share this. The people ride down the street in old cars and emergency vehicles and whatever machines are parts of the implements of their lifestyle. Tractors for agriculture. They ride along and wave to the crowd, at least until they come to a traffic stop. Then comes the American Legion. All you veterans need to come and see me after the parade. I'm And Smokey the Bear unleashes with a delicious barrage of bubblegum. Then I could hear singing. 
No parade is complete without the national anthem. Amidst the noise of the engines of the parade, people stopped and stood at attention for this song that is so integral a part of American history. And it brings a tear to my eye every time. After the national anthem was sang, it was strike up the band and the people returned to their revelry. I ambled around the town square taking in the sights and sounds. I had been invited to help judge a chili cook-off and I made my way to where it would be held. It was my first time and I was excited. And the chili cook-off itself, the judging for the chili cook-off itself, is going to be held in the kitchen of the Beddingfield Inn. Heading up the chili cook-off was Debbie Stone. I'm with the Stewart County Historical Society here in Lumpkin, Georgia, and we are doing our first annual chili cook-off because the county recently gave us a 1890 jail that needs a lot of refurbishing done. So we're doing the chili cook-off to help raise money to do that. No idea what I was talking about. And yours truly is going to be one of the judges of this thing. So uh, it's not every day you get free chili, so we'll check this out. <laughs> so, ain't gonna have much. so I took my place at the table so and started getting the lowdown. Don't talk, y'all can't talk to each other. <laughs> We're sequestered. Yeah, you're kind of sequestered. Yeah, you know, and I've got water. I've got milk in case it's, in case it's hot. Yeah, I've got We were given papers to write down our scores. It was all official like. I was joined by Jenny Nelson and Sandy Davis, who were my co-judges in this. Just pull it. Did you read this? You understand? Everybody understand the rules? Yeah, I'll get the paper handy just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've only got four entries, so I'm just going to pass you the ball. Y'all take you. You've got plenty. So I've got more spoons. There's crackers here. Just throw your dirty spoons in here when you get done. Don't use the same spoon. But once, if you want another taste. Get your clean spoon, please. No double dipping, no. No double dipping, yeah. Okay. Let the chili judging begin. And just take it, take whatever you want, take, you know, take whatever you want, and uh, pass it down for what we're doing for the, for the fair. Make sure you get them to stick in their mouth. <laughs> it was awesome, loaded with nonsense and fun. Smell, taste, appearance. <laughs> Go, go away. Okay. You take a bite, write your score, and eat a cracker to cleanse your palate. There's crackers if you want a cracker before you have this one. Unfortunately, we don't have any, you know, Grigio today. Yeah. What kind of establishment is this? And we have Step two, repeat step number one. All these chilies made by local folks were delicious. In all honesty, I could do this for a living. Step three, you know the drill. After the judging was complete, we started to disperse. We were all given a nice little present for participating in this. I would have participated for nothing at all. Thank you all so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
<laughs> Chili judging competition over. That was a lot of fun, and it was, uh, we got a gift bag for participating. And I tasted some delicious chili today. We left the folks in charge to tally up the scores, and I ambled on back outside. Outside, I met back up with Debbie Stone and got an interview. We talked about some of the things that are dealt with in dealing with historical societies and the attempts to keep a town's history from fading away. Lumpkin was founded in 18, around 1836. That's when the Betting Field Inn was, was uh, built. And it was originally a stagecoach inn between Albany and Americus. And the historical society, they were gonna tear it down and the historical society came in in the early, late 60s and redid this inn, bought the inn and redid it to preserve the history here. We have four historical designated districts, which is unusual in a small town. The buildings on the square were built in 1890. Part of the houses that are down in Westville are original houses that were here. The bell in the Methodist Church, Dr. Bedingfield brought the bell here from England on one of his trips. We have Dr. Hatchett's museum, which is not original to Lumpkin, but it is original to the area. The history here is just phenomenal. And we need people to come help us. We need people that are interested to invest their money. And you get a, you'll get a big return because you've got something here that you can't replace anymore. Now, Stacy and I do these day trips for two reasons. One is shameless self-promotion. The other is for uh, to help to preserve, to garner interest toward places that are fading. Uh, there's a website called Vanishing South Georgia because the old stuff is fading away and it needs to be preserved. And back out on the square with the knowledge that there is no magic that preserves things like this. History is kept intact by the efforts of people like you and me. And let's face it, without history, there would be no day trips. Speaking of history. So I'm sitting in Dr. Hatchett's drugstore museum and uh, he's currently giving a tour. So it may be a little while before I can do the interview. Tours here at the drugstore museum are given by Mr. Al Vygotsky, a man who is currently giving a tour. So we'll meet him in a few moments. I took this opportunity to shoot some ambient footage around the place. The place is truly beautifully preserved. And even if you don't consider yourself an enthusiast of pharmaceutical artifacts, just the sheer scope of everything that went into getting this place to this point should be of great interest to you. I think you'll see while watching this just how meticulous a place like this is to put together, to maintain, and to catalog and Mr. Vygotsky knows his stuff. Dr. Hatchett's Drugstore Museum. Now, let's meet Mr. Vygotsky. My name's Alan Vygotsky. I live in Stone Mountain, Georgia. I'm a doctor of biochemistry, and I became interested in this drugstore several years ago uh, because uh, it is a very unique drugstore. This drugstore is one of the largest collections of pharmaceutical artifacts in the country. I spent several years part-time working on the inventory, which turned out to be more than 5,000 artifacts. It is an incredible collection, and it's made even more exciting uh, for people who love pharmacy artifacts because it represents a single pharmacy. The pharmacy, the pharmacist, the original pharmacist was Dr. Uh, James Marion Hatchett, 1824 to 1894. I'd like to show you a picture of the original Dr. Hatchett. Uh, and this was a picture when he was a fairly young person. I would say maybe in his 40s. Uh, it was after the war. He had served in the 46th Georgia Infantry during the war, uh, saw action in South Carolina. And after the war, 
He moved first, I, I may have mentioned this, first to uh, White County, and I mean Harris County, Whitesville, and later to Fort uh, Gaines, where this entire drugstore was until 1957. Wow. This is also something like a medical museum, because Dr. Hatchett was a real medical doctor. Medical doctors in the 19th century generally did a little bit of everything. A surprisingly, surprisingly wide range of medicine. Um, he was a regular doctor and saw many patients. And of course, he was a pharmacist, though. He wouldn't have this place. So uh, he got his customers coming and going. <laughs> he paid a fee for, for a medical diagnosis, and then he would tell them what they needed, and they would go downstairs and get their prescriptions filled. Wow. He also could do surgery for severe cases, and some of his surgical instruments are shown here, including forceps for delivering babies. Wow. Now, I think these babies were calves. He had a lot of uh, farmers in his area, and he also did some veterinary medicine. I gotcha. But that's what they were for. Uh, and he did deliver two of his own granddaughters. Wow. I wanted to show you a trefiner, which gives a range of his sophistication as a surgeon. He also had patients who had brain damage, which would have resulted in bleeding, internal bleeding, and pressure on the skull. And so the treatment for that was to drill through the skull bone and siphon off the excess fluid. Wow. And then add some uh, antiseptic. And in the 1870s, 1880s, Southwest Georgia and a surrounding country. It was a little dangerous going out at night. So he would have his rifle, and the evidence we have for that is his gun belt, uh, where he had shells for the rifle wow. that he wore around him. That's a little bit about him. Uh, when he died, his son Samuel picked up on the store and ran it for another 60 years. And it has an incredible amount of history. It closed in 1957. And at that time, his wife locked up the store until she could find a home for the collection. And that home became here in Lumpkin, Georgia. Uh, but it is a time capsule of most of the products being from the middle 20th century, 1950s, 1940s some from the 19th century. The pharmacy looked almost exactly like this. So when his son died and his wife took over, she made it certain that, that Lumpkin received all of the original cabinets and photographs enabled the curator here to place them in the right sort of order to recapture the drugstore as it was in Fort Gaines. Wow. Okay, you've heard of uh, uh, drugstores sometimes called chemists? Yeah. Well, they, certain modern druggists study a lot of chemistry, but old time druggists were actually chemists and they concocted medical ingredients and made their own pills in the 19th century, especially uh, early 20th century. And it was quite a routine. I'm going to give you an idea of what was what went into it. Uh, medical ingredients might have been uh, minerals and plant ingredients, including uh, ingredients like these leaves of the senna plant. And uh, that's not something you feed people, so it would have to be dried and ground up. And very often, if it was a fluid medicine, they would add alcohol to extract organic ingredients, the active ingredients, and use that for selling to patients. Uh, sometimes it would make pills. Pills are really interesting. If they were making a large amount of pills, they'd use a mortar 
uh, of this, maybe of this large size, with a heavy duty pestle. Grind it up into a powder. And then they had the problem of making a powder a pill, which is still a long way to go. And what they would do is add some fluid, something that was a little bit sticky, like molasses, and grind it in to make the powder something like a clay. This very heavy porcelain plate, I believe was imported from Europe, and it's called a pill tile. It's a tile for making pills. They would take their lump of, of, of clay-like material containing the pills and or the chemicals and put it on the pill tile, roll it into a cylinder like a worm but thinner and put it along parallel to the line to the uh, line here. And then if they wanted small pills, they could roll it into a long, thin cylinder or not. And then they could use these lines for cutting uniform pills. The pills would then be sticky. They'd roll it in their hands and make little balls and in a way that was not so very sanitary. <laughs> put them in jar, in, in vials wow. for sale. So that's how early pills were made. Later on, Dr. Hatchett and his son got a little bit fancier. The uh, company did very, the store did very well. <laughs> In the 19th century, this was a pill machine, and it was uh, made in the 1880s. Uh, and it was for making lots of pills at one time. Oh. So you'd start off with that same uh, cylinder, uh, clay-like cylinder containing the medicine, and put it over here, over here and roll it, make it even, and then push it from here. Uh, Emma Jean Hatchett, who is the widow of Samuel Hatchett, the son of Dr. Hatchett, Emma Jean uh, first thought about Fort Gaines, and the city was not able to pick up on the financial responsibility of staffing and and uh, maintaining a collection of this size. Mm. She then, I think uh, she moved to Columbus at some point mm. with her son, and they tried to find a home for it in Columbus. Columbus picked up a small fraction, maybe less than a percent of the artifacts, and then decided they were not prepared to build a museum around it. Somehow, and I don't know all the people involved, it, there were people here in Stewart County who were very interested in antiquity. They had Bennington in, they wanted to add this drugstore museum. It wasn't much when they came, when they looked at it, it was empty. There were no cabinets, walls, and uh, walls in great need of painting and restoration. But it was with that background that the community got together and somehow raised the funds and the energy to restore this building and this museum. It's a tribute to Stewart County. And I'm not from Stewart County, so <laughs> I can say that. <laughs> nice. Totally unbiased, my friends. <laughs> it was a true pleasure to get a tour from Mr. Vygotsky. So I headed back out onto the square, into the sunshine. They had live bands playing all day. And at this particular point in the day, some of my very good friends were playing, the Chattahoochee Woodshedders. And a very special part of the show, we got a chance to interview Timeless Paranormal. Uh, my husband and I run the paranormal group Timeless Paranormal, and we are here for our third investigation at the Bedding Field Inn in Lumpkin, Georgia. 
So far, uh, the last two investigations we've done, we have communicated with a spirit named Samuel Bedingfield. He actually identified himself by first and last name through our communication devices. And we have communicated with a six-year-old little girl who identifies herself as Sarah, and she says she is Samuel's niece. We believe that spirits can be anywhere. And there may have been something here before the house was. For example, this inn was built in 1836. Before that, it was Creek Indian land. Uh, so what we, I try to do is I try to actually research the property and the families that I find that lived here so we can ask relevant questions in our EVP sessions. We don't want to limit ourselves to just who may have, have built the current structure. Right. And what are you what are you aiming for tonight? Uh, tonight we've actually got a couple of new pieces of equipment that we didn't have with us last time that we're wanting to try out. I have also made a new list of questions to try to get more biographical information on Sarah uh, because I've been trying to do her family genealogy and I cannot find whose daughter she was that was connected to Samuel Benning. One of the things that we use that a lot of the more well-known groups don't do on the TV shows is use dowsing rods, um, which are used anything finding water, finding oil, and answering paranormal questions. Um, I have my rods, and what I do is ask, normally when we get to a place, the first thing I ask is, may I douse? Can I douse and should I douse? And it will tell me if there's somebody here that is willing to speak to us. And I, I did all that earlier. Um, this is the room where Sarah likes to stay, as you can see with the toys. Uh, we brought her a ball this time that we could hear move if she decided she wanted to play with it. So far she hasn't. Right now we're trying to convince her that the K2 meter won't hurt her if she touches it because she was six years old and died in the 1800s. She has no oh, idea right. what this is. So we always try to introduce the new equipment and let them know that it's it's not going to do anything to them, but it helps us let, know that they're here. Yeah. So. The function behind the K2 is that uh, we use a couple of different types of EMF cages. The K2 is one that uses lights. The other one is the little box sitting on the uh, stand over there is called a millimeter. It reads electromagnetic fields in various ranges, and it also has what's uh, an ambient temperature probe on it. So we can so see the cold spots. If cold spots pick up, we can see the temperature change wherever we place the probe. The little box you saw on the floor is a what we call a paranormal lamp. It pushes energy and ionizes the air in the room giving the, the spirits and entities energy to pull from. So they you can know, drain our so batteries. You see in a lot of things where you see batteries drain and they're brand new and you know they kill the camera. We give something else to throw out there in the air to help them out. I see. It's interesting. So. I would take the dowsing rods and I would um, ask Sarah, are you here? And see they could cross. For me, when they cross, that's a yes. And I would ask her to straighten the rods out for me. Thank you. And I would say, Sarah, can you show me where you're standing? Or show me where you're sitting? Show me where you're at. You don't have to be shy because Brian's here. Show me where you're at. You're still on the bed? She's been saying she's been on the bed since we came in here. I'm crossing for me. Thank you. It, it's also a thing to point out. A lot of people would say you're moving the rods. Hmm. See, In actuality, she's not these. touching the rods at all. Oh. The little plastic straws are. See, you can, if I'm moving them, I have to actually move my right. hand. Mm -hmm. They they spin inside the straw, so she's only holding a straw. Gotcha. Sarah, can you show me where the dollies are? Usually when they're going to point and, so, and tell us where something's at, thank you. they'll use typically one rod. Sarah has a tendency, when she wants me to go somewhere, a lot of times she'll push them both. Hmm. Show me where you want Dave to go. 
She you know, loves for him to stand by that closet. <laughs> Every time we ask, and I can say, show me where Dave is. He said they'll move and point. You straight him back out, Sarah? Thank you. Show me where Brian is. See, she's pointing right at you. You want to try the spirit box? Okay, right now it's at a fixed point. I'm going to start a sweep. And you can see how fast they move from the station. You, you hear the, oh, yeah, yeah. Hear the bumps of the radio station. Yeah. Now, once I put it in here, that's what's called the third one. Okay. And it kills the RF. You don't hear any more radio aspect. Oh, gotcha. Only with, yeah. All so you hear is the white voice. Is going to be a spirit voice. Sarah, you want to talk to the box? I know you're being a little shy today, but, you know, some people here really like to hear you talk. So, can you tell them your name? Now, last time we were here, you named the dolly. Can you tell them what the name of the dolly is? Do you remember what our names are? Can you tell us? different kind of camera than what we've got and if you go stand next to Dave he'll be able to see you on it when he plays it back later. Can you go stand next to Dave so Brian can see you on his camera? Well, I haven't played the tape back yet. You never know. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not just, it's not all about what you can record and catch. It, the, the personal experience is a really, you know, you were like, a lot of people say, oh, I know, that didn't have to be. I felt it not there. Some examples of, I'm, I'm going to play the couple that we got in here of Sarah. With um, the spirit box. Yeah, with the spirit box. Um, this is. Toy. And see that. And you can very plainly tell it's a little girl. It's the same voice as her. Hold on again. 
You can see, you know, when when we ask a question, it takes them a little while to be able to get that to come uh, through. We but some, of some of them are very clear. Yeah. And I'll take multiples if I've been told take pictures here, take pictures there. I'll snap three, maybe shift a little and snap three, shift again, snap a couple more. When we caught the nine that we did in there, it was out of a batch of sixty-seven pictures I've taken. Wow. And, and that shadow only showed oh, up in those nights. Yeah. Focused because he wanted to go stand next to her. Mm. I stopped taking after she said, I feel him. And it's like, okay, it's gone. I took about five more and then it stopped. Yeah. Um, because once they start trying to do something like that, it tends to drain them a little bit. The part of the reason that we do it, you know, that that's why our tagline is, um, Investigations rooted in history. Yeah. Because we want to learn from the spirits. We right. don't just want to go in and, oh, this place is haunted. Right. You know, we want to try to figure out, okay, yes, it's haunted. Who's it haunted by? Mm -hmm. How are they connected with the yeah. property? You know, we, we want to learn about the spirits. And Sarah, I mean, you want to tell him bye? Here you go, Sarah, in the camera. Go sit next to your dollies and, and wave bye. Yeah. And thus brings us to the end of a really cool interview with Timeless Paranormal. I'd like to thank David and Shannon Byers for inviting me in and allowing me to shoot their session. We have plans in the near future for a more extensive shoot. Though we got no images on camera and nothing talked through the spirit box, you can find more conclusive evidence and more of their work at this website. David and Shannon are extremely professional in their approach and really nice people. If you have any paranormal activity going on that you would like investigated, please contact them. As for the Bedding Field Inn, I do believe it's open for things such as weddings and special occasions, so book yours today. I'd like to thank everybody in Lumpkin, who showed us a very warm welcome and a wonderful time, and we will be back. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Day Trip in Lumpkin, Georgia at their annual fair on the square. We'll see you next time.